Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you for joining the Performance Analytics uh, Academy session that we have today. We have another great one on tap. We're going to talk about some tuning solutions for reporting. Okay, so real quickly, um, logistical information. So this is for you. We try to bring fresh ideas and better understanding and some practical guidance for you. So make sure that you ask questions. If you have questions, please put those questions in the Q&A session or window rather than the chat if possible. We do have other um, a, a hosts that are on this meeting that will answer questions if they can while the meeting is going on. Um, and if we need to stop during the presentation, we'll do that as well. Uh, but, you know, make sure that you get something out of this and this is being recorded. If that is an issue for your organization, you may want to go ahead and drop now and it's being recorded so we can actually put this out on the community later on today. And it will also be on our YouTube channel um, as well with all the other previous recordings that we have had. So today, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about some tuning solutions for reporting. And uh, we have the great pleasure of having Isaac um, on today. So with that, uh, Isaac, if you are ready, let's get rolling. That way we can give a, a lot of good time to the great information that you have. So if you want to go ahead and start sharing, you're more than welcome. Yes, I will. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Isaac Papagianidis, as Thomas already mentioned, and I'm a PM uh, with uh, uh, Performance Analytics and Reporting uh, Business Unit. So what we're going to talk today is uh, our tuning solutions for reporting. And uh, uh, mainly, well, first of all, I'll describe a bit what the problem is, what, is, uh, what we refer to when we're talking about tuning, then a, a bit uh, we'll go through uh, some different types of uh, reports that we currently have, like the lists or the ones that contain aggregations. And uh, actually, after each one of these two, uh, we'll have some key takeaways. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, the problem statement. So, uh, and I made it a bit interactive. So we click and then we have multiple different ways of expressing the waiting time. Uh, designers usually are quite uh, uh, creative in this, but then after waiting some time, you get the number that you want, right? So this is uh, uh, a way just to explain that, well, this is a performance problem. You were expecting to get an answer relatively fast, but this can last really long and you can wait for quite sorry, quite some time, and that is not going to be there. So in general, well, the problem is everyone has an expectation, and usually we all want something. Uh, uh, when we request some data, we want them to be with us as soon as possible. And But of course, it's not uh, possible that every request can be achieved equally fast. And that's something that uh, we have to keep in mind. But there are some things that, uh, some factors that uh, actually affect the performance. And this is what we're going to look into today. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I wrote some here, but uh, we'll go through them uh, uh, in detail later on. So uh, first of all, I started with lists. Uh, lists is actually one of the most used uh, visualizations for our reports in our platform. So I think uh, it's around 60% of the visualizations in our platform uh, are lists. So everyone loves lists, especially when you have quite a lot of uh, or less data. Personally, I prefer lists only when the number of records are limited, but uh, that's not always the case. And so the lists and how they affect. First of all, is the number of rows that we have per page. And for that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen a bit and I'll take you to uh, my instance. So here, for example, we can view uh, an incident list. And as you all might be aware, we have here the option to show. And you can show from 10 records up to 100 records. And of course, this is uh, something that uh, uh, affects the performance based on what you are seeing, especially on lists. So you have to be a bit careful if you are showing, of course, 10 might be too less, 100 is in between. That's why out of the box it comes with 20, but your admins in your platform can uh, change this uh, setting for the users that are logged into the user. Of course, the more data you are showing, uh, uh, the slower it can become. Um, I have here some uh, 
let me share my screen again. Okay, so I put here some numbers and I'm going to demonstrate a bit uh, the difference as you are seeing. So as we're looking at, we have uh, eight columns in, in our report uh, here. Let me go to the table instance. And we have all these fields. And as you can see, for 100 records, it loads in, well, at the moment, it, runs, it loads in 1.5 uh, seconds. The moment you start adding fields, because especially for users that are not admins, you can see that, for example, this list of 100 records that loaded relatively fast, now it became really slow. It became five seconds, 5.5 seconds. And if I add more fields and can add more. And uh, the reason for this is not that, uh, well, of course, I hijacked it so that it will become a bit slow so that I can demonstrate a performance issue. But what I wanted to, to demonstrate is that depending on the number of fields, it's not that it, that field that you added contains something, but security can be added on that field. So there might be um, some logic behind that field that should not allow you to see that. Uh, specific values or records. And then, of course, if you add more and more uh, uh, fields in your list, then yeah, you can have a quite big performance hit. So you can have the same records, uh, even if you are showing 20 records, it can take up to nine seconds in this case. Of course, as I said, uh, uh, this is something that I created, but uh, based on our uh, support cases, we had these uh, uh, sometimes uh, to increase the number of seconds up to 20 for a single page of 20 records on any table. So please be careful. I mean, the number of rows, of course, it affects performance and the number of columns. Uh, make sure that you add the columns that you are actually uh, using. Don't try to uh, to add all the fields because this is what we uh, most of the end users do, especially in our in the cases that we have uh, in our support portal. Uh, everyone adds a uh, hundred fields. Of course, usually the information is stored in three or four of them. What you really are looking for, or a bit more, and um, uh, try to avoid having big lists, a lot of data because. Uh, that can cause these performances that I just uh, demonstrated. Uh, another uh, issue that we've seen throughout uh, the years is that uh, in our platform, we have uh, journal fields. And what are the journal fields? They are the comments and the work notes that we uh, someone is adding on uh, in an incident or in a case. So those fields, because of the specific type of it, uh, it uh, it doesn't hold the complete history of it. It shows only a number of it. And because they are stored in a separate table, it can reduce a lot the performance of your list. So if you try to add here, for example, the work notes or the comments and work notes. So this is going to make the list even slower because it has to go through all uh, these records. And as you can see, these are some demo data. It increases the performance uh, of the uh, of this list. Uh, it increases the time it takes. And the second field, let me go back. Second, okay. And then uh, this was in the journal at least. And then of course we have the go to search. Now, what is the go to search? The go to search is the search that we have up here. So this is a very useful search because uh, many people are uh, uh, using it, and uh, uh, quite a lot of users don't know what type of uh, wildcards can be used there. And of course, the type of the wildcard you are using is going to affect the performance as well. So for example, you can uh, search. Uh, values, uh, usually this is the most common uh, wildcard, which is uh, find me any, any name, for example, that contains uh, the letter A, B, C. And of course, in order to achieve that, uh, the database takes really a lot of time because it has to go through all the records. So in instances where the number of records are really quite high, there are a few millions or billions, then it will take a bit more time than expected and it will make the whole reporting experience uh, not that pleasant. So knowing how to search always helps on how you, uh, in the performance that uh, and uh, uh, the time that it takes to retrieve the data. 
Uh, of course, usually, uh, if you know exactly what you're looking for, using the equal term is uh, the equal wildcard is uh, the best way because you know I'm looking for a name that is uh, done. So you are searching for a specific value, or if you are just uh, uh, if you know that something starts with a certain way and the, and you don't know how it ends. These are type of queries that you can use to make sure that you help a bit the database to retrieve the data fast. Of course, keep in mind, if you have 50 or 100 records on the table, it's not going to be affected too much. But you have to keep in mind that uh, in really big data sets, try to keep it uh, to limit as much as you can uh, the data. Uh, later on, I'm going to talk about conditions. Most probably, this is something that will come right after. And then uh, these wildcards will also uh, uh, make sense. Now, in general, for lists, the key takeaways is just make sure that you limit the number of rows. There is no point looking at 100 incidents if you're not going to go through all of them and so that you will uh, evaluate each one of them to see if it contains something. And there are cases that it is needed, but uh, it's not the most common uh, one. So try to limit it to 10 or 20 so that you'll get an idea of your data and then use the conditions to limit the number of records. Uh, the number of columns in the list, uh, as I mentioned earlier, make sure you add only the columns that you are interested in. And uh, people that have a specific role in the platform, they can uh, personalize the list and keep it uh, how they uh, want it to be. And that is really, really helpful. And for the journal fields, as I mentioned, uh, as you saw in the list uh, earlier here, it's not very helpful. You see only part of it, and then you have to hover over to see the complete text. So uh, it doesn't really make sense to read uh, through the list. Uh, of course, if you open the record, then you can see the real work notes in uh, the way that uh, they are presented. Uh, usually, and as you can see, uh, you can read uh, what is written there, the complete uh, uh, history of the record. So adding it in the list usually doesn't help. And that's also something that uh, you can define. And the last but not least were the operators that you can use in the go to search. Usually the equal operator is the fastest one because you know exactly what you're looking for, but also using operators that how the uh, the value that you're looking for starts, it's very helpful. If you don't know if it is, if uh, your search string is in the beginning or in the end, and it might be contained somewhere, then you should expect a bit uh, slower queries, especially if you do not limit uh, the set of records that you are searching for. Um, moving forward a bit to uh, aggregations. Uh, so, uh, Reports with aggregations. And what are these reports? It's usually whatever uh, report you have and you are using group by fields. So you can say, for example, give me the number of records group by category, group by summon group, or uh, based on any set of conditions that you have. And what affects the performance of this type of queries? It's a bit uh, different than the previous one in the list. So in our aggregations, well, uh, first of all, the database index, which of course it affects lists as well. So what I'm going to mention here, uh, it affects all types of reports. Uh, the filtered queries, and that's also something that uh, I'm going to explain later. And then of course, dot works and DB views, which can be a bit more tricky and a bit more technical, but I'll try to make uh, sure I explain it uh, as uh, simply as I can. Uh, database indexes. And what are database indexes, for example? Uh, here we have just a list of names, for example, and a list of numbers, right? They are, uh, if someone is searching for a specific value here, in order to find it, you'll have to go one by one to evaluate if what you're looking for is there, right? And this makes it really, really slow to find uh, data. And this is what database indexes actually do. What they do, they bring that list and they sort it, they keep uh, an index uh, where uh, with the field that you select. And in this case, it is the name field. So that, for example, if I know that the uh, keyword that I'm looking for starts with the uh, letter P, I know directly that I will come down to the line that the first P starts and then I will find the information, which is usually 
the number in this case. Uh, uh, I think it's a quite uh, known case with uh, uh, yellow books, so the phone number uh, that we used to have, uh, not in our phones uh, earlier days, but uh, in uh, books where we had uh, every page with a different uh, letter so that we'll know exactly what we're looking for. Of course, database indexes improve performance really a lot. They make it really fast to find the information even for the databases. Of course, databases, yeah, this is a simple example to understand how it works. They have quite a lot of configuration behind it, but all of this is already done uh, by us and by your admins. So the end users, uh, all they need to do is just make sure that uh, they use this type of indexes. So in our platform, just uh, a short comment, we are using all the reference fields, for example, they have an index behind it. So assignment group, assignee or the caller, all these fields are indexed. So when you are searching information about a specific assignment group, the data is retrieved faster than if you are searching something with short description, for example. Uh, and of course, indexes, as I mentioned, can be created with uh, on almost on every field. But at the same time, uh, as you can see here, I created uh, my index on the number. So I, uh, but if I am not searching with the number, uh, then this index is not really helpful. And although we do have indexes in our tables, we don't use them. So you know, this is something that happened qu quite often in the past. A lot of uh, uh, people, when they learn about indexes and they have the access to create it because you need to be an admin in the platform, they start creating indexes on every field in the platform, but that doesn't make it faster. It can make it slower, uh, actually. Uh, you cannot, uh, because the database, when there are multiple indexes, tries to find uh, which index uh, it should use uh, so that it will make the query perform correctly. And that then if your indexes are not correctly uh, defined, then that can make uh, the performance query uh, slower than expected. So, as I mentioned, uh, key, ta key takeaways here, well, uh, indexes are helpful, but not all of them are useful. So we have to make sure that we create indexes on the fields that are, we usually have as either uh, uh, that we do grouping on them, or we use them as uh, uh, conditions. This way we make sure that the database performs really fast. So uh, don't try to create, for example, a field that is a type string where the data can be typed by a user and then you want to start grouping by that field. That doesn't really help either the platform or your data integrity because everyone can type differently and at the same time uh, the data uh, will not uh, be accurate at the end of the day. And as I said earlier, there are multiple, uh, there can be multiple uh, indexes uh, on a certain table in our platform. This way we make sure that different types of queries perform uh, fast. Uh, what you need to be aware of is that there are certain cases that uh, the database might select uh, an index that is not the correct, uh, at least for a specific use case. And for those cases, you can contact our support uh, and uh, our support engineers can point uh, the database which index they should use uh, so that uh, your query will perform fast. And the last point, I think I mentioned it already, that our reference fields in our platform have already indexes. So try to use, and you can identify them uh, by the magnifier that we have right uh, next to it. Now, moving to... Filter queries, efficient filter queries. So, hey, Isaac, yeah. can, yes. can I interrupt you very briefly? We just had one question on indexes. Um, the question was: Is there any way to see or to, to see or quest to see if database indexes are actually being used? Uh, there is a way um, uh, to see it uh, in the UI. You mean when you execute the query? You there is a way. There is a way. Okay. Um, you can see the query that is generated, but you cannot see the index that is being used. Yeah, uh, that would... When you create, 
Yes, it's a bit of an admin. Would, yeah. Wouldn't have to be like in the logs? Yeah, in the slow queries in our platform, for example, we can see, uh, and now here it's just a list of slow queries, we can see the query and we can see uh, which index uh, can be used. So here, uh, when we are checking the slow queries, we can run an explain plan, as it is called, and here you can see which indexes are on the table and what can be used. And that way, uh, you, uh, of course, there is another step uh, for forcing the query that you want to use. And if you know how to read the explain plan, then you'll understand if something used or not a query. But in the UI, we do not uh, provide this information. One other question, why not system select recent index table? I'm not quite sure. Recent index table. I'm not sure I understand it. I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, uh, the person who put that in there, could you, uh, I'll go ahead and specify that it was answered. Could you go ahead and clarify what you mean by it? System select recent index table. I'm not really sure what that means. Tell you what, what I will do is why don't we set this aside for the moment and then yes. uh, e either if you get a chance to type it in or we will let you go on live to ask a question as time allows. So. Yeah, that would be great. So, All right, thanks. Uh, thank you. Efficient filter queries. So here, I, uh, this is, uh, this is a, uh, an average instance in our uh, uh, data centers a couple of years ago. So around 30% of our uh, records on the task table are usually uh, active and all the rest are closed. So here I have a couple of queries. So for example, sort description uh, like email and state is not closed and state is not resolved. So um, it's obvious you are looking for anything that is uh, that had an email in our sort description and it is still active actually that's what you're trying to say so you can uh, actually uh, what you can do instead of just because this query uh, it takes around 30 seconds to execute in an instance where you are having this number of records uh, but if you just add another condition where it says active is true, then what you do actually, you exclude all these uh, records much faster because we do have a uh, filter and an index on the active table, which makes it easier to exclude these, uh, these uh, almost 3 million records in our platform. This will make the database perform much faster and it will make the query run from 30 seconds down to one or two max. So uh, sometimes adding a condition, which as you can see, doesn't really uh, make a big difference in the data because the data that you will retrieve are the same. The only difference is that we are using a field that is currently indexed and uh, we exclude all these records really fast. And that makes our performance much faster. So the active field is one of the fields that quite a lot of people uh, do not use in our instances, but it's one of the most crucial because usually you don't want to mix, at least in most of the use cases, you don't want to mix the active records and the closed ones. So this is something that uh, is very helpful and, and quite a lot of uh, customers change in their application menu all the links to contain uh, this active is true or active is false, false uh, as a hard-coded uh, condition to make it easier and more performant for the end user. Um, okay, I just uh, read, uh, why not the system? Select recent index table. So the index table is not just one, right? Uh, so the index table, uh, uh, either, as I said, you, we can have multiple indexes. So I can actually, I can demonstrate that it might be easier. So if we go to the tables in the platform and uh, I'll pick up, uh, I'll pick up the most favorite one, Fevron, which is task, and it contains the most indexes now. Yeah, so we have these 64 different indexes, right? So these are the fields as they are called in the database. I'm not going to go into 
details what does this a ref 13 means that's a bit different so for example here we have the closed by and active okay and this is the name of the index which is called closed by so there are multiple different indexes and you as you can see the active field for example it exists in quite a lot of them so different indexes uh, help in different cases so in this case uh, let me take so here you're looking for the service offering and active and here you lo you're looking at the closed by with active and or the cmdb ci business application and active as you can see so the active field is contained in almost all of our indexes which makes the performance of this type of queries much faster and i think this also answers the question for steven rogers uh, yeah, I was going to ask you that, but I think you may have just answered that. Yes. So the main reason are is the indexes. So the active field is one of the fields that we have the index, as I mentioned earlier, and this makes the performance really fast. Instead of even if you are looking for closed incidents, and even if you have these three uh, million records, uh, if if you specify active is false, then the database knows automatically whatever is open is excluded. So it limits the number of records that it needs to evaluate the rest of the condition so that it will return the data to, to the end user. So this is why uh, using indexes is really, really important. It's the only way to help the database uh, retrieve the data for us much faster. I hope, Stephen, it answered your question. Yeah, and, and Isaac, one other quick one. Does the order of the filtered columns make a difference in performance? Yes, it does. It does because uh, you can have, um, here I don't have this example, but you can have uh, multiple indexes that might have uh, five or six fields, and the uh, order of the fields is different. Active might be first or third or fourth. That depends a bit on the, what type of database you have and how it was configured. And there is a process in all the databases which uh, it's the optimizer which selects which index it should use. Sometimes databases can select the wrong index. And for those cases, as I mentioned earlier, if this happens, you can uh, uh, ask uh, if you do, if you are sure you have the index as it's supposed to be, you can ask our support engineers to make sure that a query from a specific report uses the index that you created for that use case. Because, for example, that report is in a, a C level dashboard or it is being used by most of your users on a daily basis and the performance needs to be uh, yeah, quite good. So the order does make a difference, but it doesn't always have to be an exact match as it is. So it is a bit of a more technical and depth, which uh, we will not go into that now. But uh, it, if you have similar indexes, it can affect the performance. OK, now. Uh, this is about the uh, uh, performance of this uh, type of query. So just to give this example so that you'll understand how big the difference is from one to the other. And moving forward, I think uh, one of the most used uh, features of our platform, which is DotWorks. So everyone likes DotWorks. And um, I, I, even I do, and I use it on a daily basis. But there is also an efficient way to use them. and. Uh, and they can help you, uh, and, but they can also make uh, our lives difficult and slow uh, our reports. So as you can see here on the left side, what I have is uh, assignment group is software, right? Basic query, as I said, it's uh, all of our reference fields, which you can easily identify with the magnifier right next to them. They are indexed, so this retrieves the data directly and fast, and we have what we need. But the same query, with, which gives you exactly the same data, can be assignment group dot name is software, which makes it a bit tricky because then the data, what we do, we need to go to that uh, table which assignment group is told, and then find out from there where the name is equals that, and then retrieve it, and then join the two tables and give you the results. So that makes it a bit faster, a bit slower. Sorry. So if you use assignment group dot name equals uh, software, it's a bit slower than just saying uh, assignment group is software. So try to use it efficiently, but at the same time, uh, because I, it's understandable that you cannot avoid using .box and it's, uh, it's absolutely necessary most of the times, 
but you should try to avoid having multiple dot works. So as you can see here, just put an example, assignment group, manager, location, company, contact, name. I mean, if there is a, such a requirement that you need to have uh, reports on your dashboards, uh, that you need to dot work on uh, four or five different uh, tables, then what you might need to consider uh, is if you bring that data to the table where you report on, because uh, this is actually joining all these tables so that you can find out uh, when the name starts with David, so this is an example, but uh, it doesn't really uh, help because for every record, we'll have to do all these joins and find out the, the outcome of, the, uh, of all the names that contain David and they are contacts of companies with a certain location of the manager of the assignment group. So it is really, really slow. It's better to bring the data from that table to the table that you're running your query on. It's incidents in this case. So you can, uh, for example, come here. I think this is a query. Yeah, I changed it to Nelly here. It's not David, but you can see uh, you don't need to do all these things. You can bring the information of the user directly on the incident table, and then the report will run much faster. And um, this is about dot box. And okay, now uh, one of the most uh, beautiful features in our platform is database views. And what is a database view? It's a simple way to join, to create a join query, or actually to be able to join information from different tables. Um, and how, uh, of course, you have to be an admin to create a database views. And let me take you a bit. So out of the box, we provide uh, the metrics. Uh, and the incident metric, for example, database view. And what is the incident metric database view? It's just uh, a join, as I mentioned earlier, between these three tables, the incident table, the metric instance table, where we store all the different uh, changes for all the fields and the metric definition table. So, uh, okay, I can move forward. So, um, as you can see, this is a quite generic database view, but for on this table on metric instance, we have multiple different definitions that can be, that refer to the same table, which is the incident table. So out of the box, for example, we have uh, all these uh, uh, eight, uh, seven, sorry, uh, these seven metric definitions, which uh, store information uh, on the metric instance table, which contains all the changes of the field uh, incident state, for example, if you're using incident state. Sometimes, because although the database view is uh, relatively fast, if you have really millions or billions of records in your instance, you might need to make sure that you create a database view that limits uh, the data directly to the definition that you want. So at the moment, if you create, for example, if someone creates a report based on incident metric, he will be able to have access to all of these uh, seven different uh, metric definitions. So he can find out records from all of this. But if this is, uh, as you can imagine, if you have, to, I don't know, 100 million record incidents, and uh, for every incident you have, for example, 10, uh, changes on all of these fields, then you have to multiply 70 with 100 million, and that uh, will make uh, the query really, really slow. This is why sometimes it's really helpful to limit the number of records that you have in your database use. How can you do that? By just adding a simple condition here that you specify that, you know what, out of all of these seven, I care only about the uh, assigned to duration so that you'll know uh, you want to create reports for the assigned to and how long it took uh, for each one uh, to work on an incident. And this way, by just adding in here the workloads, your, the data that you're going to retrieve are going to become less and that will increase significantly the performance depending, of course, on the number of records that you have. But uh, what we experienced just by adding this condition it will increase the performance around 60 or 70%, especially on instances where uh, the number of records are and the number of changes are quite a lot. 
and with this, I I think I finished what I want to present. Okay, great, Isaac. Um, so we did have some questions that came in, obviously that we answered um, typed, and then also that you uh, answered out loud. So I don't see um, any other answer or any of the questions that's coming at this point. So. Um, if you have a question, anybody that's on the call has any any questions that they'd like to ask, this would be the time for you to do that um, about the content that was shared today, or uh, we have enough time that we could answer some other questions if you have any other questions as well. So um, great information that you shared today, Isaac. I know that quite often people ask questions in the community about things like this. So it'd be nice to give them a reference tool to, to hopefully figure out a couple of those. So uh, we do have a couple questions came in. So the first one is, do you recommend using data sets instead of tables? And I don't know if they're meaning database views or do they mean data sets uh, instead of tables? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand what. Yeah, we're going to need to get some clarification on that. So um, if you could give some clarification on that and put that in there, we'll, we'll answer that. So, um, and then the second from David. Okay, there we go. What is the performance hit on is one? Yeah, I'm kind of struggling even. even. Is one of queries. Yeah, I think it refers to the condition where we say state is one of, uh, yeah. for example, new. He, uh, yeah, he, he clarified the question a little better there. Yeah. Is yeah. one of. So what is the what is the performance hit on is one of queries? Yes, so uh, that depends. Of course, is one of it's like doing or queries that you're saying. So the value of the field is uh, the value of the state, for example, is new, or the value is uh, x, y, or z. So this increases a bit, of course, the, uh, the the time for the database to retrieve the data. But as I mentioned earlier, if the the field that you're doing this is indexed, then the retrieval will be really fast. So if you if the field that you're using for all your workflows on a table like a state field is indexed, then the retrieval will be it will be much faster. The one of queries is as I mentioned, it's like doing multiple or queries. So and especially when you use or on one field is fast, but if you try to say, uh, for example, I want all the incidents that were created by Thomas or by Isaac, and then you say either this subset or a, sub a different subset where it was created previous year. So the more conditions that you add, it can become really slow. So the one of queries, if the field is uh, indexed, it, can, it will increase a bit the time that you retrieve the data, but not too much, as long as you have an index. If you don't have an index, then it's going to be uh, slower. Okay. I don't remember though to, to tell you exactly how, because that depends quite a lot on the table and the usage of the data. Okay, great. And then on the first question that I'll go ahead and answer this one. So um, it's basically asking, do you recommend um, data sources rather than reporting directly on the table uh, for reports? So, so there, there's a lot of benefits of using a data source, uh, creating a data source on a table for reporting. Uh, you can obviously apply some, some governance there. So if there's particular ways that you want your um, whoever's doing the reports or whatnot to build them out, there's certain things that you want them to always uh, or certain things you always want to be sort of set as a standard, then using a data source gives you the ability to to do that. And then the other great thing about a data source rather than reporting directly on a table is that if you create a data source that's looking for a particular period of time or a particular state or a particular priority, then you're already going to give yourself a, a better uh, performance hit just because you've already dwindled down the amount of results that you can you can get. Quite often when you know people report directly on a report, if they're not familiar with the table structure and they don't know how many rows uh, are in that table, or if they don't know exactly the best way to put filters on it, then obviously you can get a report that has some serious latency issues because they may be building a report on a table that has a million records and they're looking for 
uh, or they don't put any filters, right? They put every, they just, it's wide open and it's just trying to return that amount of records. Uh, so I would say, I mean, if you can use data sources, I think that they're a really good tool that um, you can use to really put a lot of governance around th the way that things are being reported and also, you know, um, control some performance issues there as well. So I don't know if uh, Isaac or Dan want to add anything on there, but I think that those are, there's a couple of great benefits to using data sources. You're absolutely right, Thomas. I, totally I think it's good. I think it's just, it's just yeah. important to note that there is, there really isn't anything inherently faster about data sources other than the scenario that Thomas mentioned. Um, but just from, a, you know, more from a, the direct speed, not necessarily, but from, you know, just the understanding that you're using a predefined query that is very likely the fastest query that they are, that, that someone already predefined is, is going to give you some speed and, you know, some speed enhancements. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. So another one that came in, it says, is there an impact to the order of elements in a query? I'm not so sure. I don't know if this is kind of similar to the conditions questions that was asked earlier. Um, if that's the way that I'm reading it. Yeah, I think it'd else. be like saying, you know, does it make a difference if I put active is true first versus fifth in my list of conditions? I think is what we're talking about here. Yeah, and I think yeah, we but, actually talked to that a little bit earlier, yeah, didn't we? Right. So, so, so Daniel, uh, and I mean, I don't mind, Isaac, if you want to answer it quickly, you can answer it again. But I know that we did talk about that a little bit earlier, Daniel, unless there's something else specifically that um, that we're missing about your question. Yeah, maybe just 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 quickly, because it sounds like you might have missed it. So if you just maybe just quickly. If you could just if there's just a quick answer to that. Just to re-answer it. Yeah, uh, so the, impact, the, the only thing that can change the, uh, the order of the elements is the way that the database will understand which query to use. So it usually doesn't uh, make a big difference, but if you have similar indexes, that can affect a bit the, the order and the performance that the order will affect the performance uh, of the retrieval. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> So uh, David had a question. How about on record number of queries? Yes, I think this refers to the, well, uh, in our platform, all the aggregations are using Glide uh, aggregate and all the lists are using Glide record. So Glide aggregate, of course, if you're looking just for numbers, it's much faster uh, usually than using, than viewing the data in the list. So uh, record number queries are always faster than uh, the lists. Of, co uh, of course, if you have the same conditions in the list and in uh, the glide uh, aggregate in the total, uh, always the total will be much faster because it has to return only one number instead of the complete data set as it comes from the database. Okay, great. So, um... Another one from John, if we filter on sysids rather than display values, can we gain any performance improvements regardless of indexing? Well, sysids in our platform are always indexed. They are the primary keys of our tables. So when you use a sysid, it's fast. But of course, you cannot expect the user to know the sysid of uh, a value. This is why uh, this conversion of the label that you see of, or as we were looking earlier at the assignment group, which says software behind it is the sysid and that's what we use. So uh, of course, if you write a script, uh, yes, if you would, don't have to dot walk to the next table to just pick up the label because you're writing script directly in a certain table. Yes, then uh, uh, using sysids will be faster. Otherwise, uh, it is the same uh, performance, at least, because the conversion of the sysid to label, we do it in the UI in most of the cases, and uh, you get the performance that you need. Okay, great. So another question that is actually something unrelated, and I think that probably um, there's probably a lot of different answers for this question based on what someone's flavor is, but um, is there a suggestion number, a suggestion for the max number of widgets on a dashboard tab and the number of tabs on one dashboard to improve um, performance? So um, 
the general rule that that um, that I've, I've heard quite often and what I've always tried to do um, and not always been successful at it. But uh, early on in my customer days, I think that it got a little bit out of control. But I think whatever widgets that um, that you can see on the screen without scrolling is probably a, a good rule of thumb. Not saying that you could not have um, more, but if you can you know, uh, keep it to the less scrolling, uh, you're, you're probably better off, um, the best route. And then as it relates to the number of tabs, um, I think that, um, and if I remember correctly, I, I felt like um, we have a health scan that looks for um, when there's, uh, and Dan helped me out on this one, but I believe it was either seven or more or 11 or more just because of um, the performance issues. Just It's just too much and um, and then not, not exactly knowing what's on each tab. I think you're better off trying to break that dashboard up and trying to figure out you know topics that are related on the dashboard to maybe even create a new dashboard. But I think that probably uh, both Dan and Isak may have a opinion on that as well. Yeah, I would just go with what you're saying there, and you know that it's it's more of a it becomes more of a readability and a usability than as much as a uh, as, as much as it really more so than a than a system performance type of issue when we're talking about tabs, but uh, that's my understanding of that. Yeah, because yeah. the the t the data on the tabs aren't loaded until you actually click on them. So, and even that's the same thing from a scrolling perspective that, you know, a widget's not going to render until it's visible on the screen, but just from a general purpose, you know, or, or mindset of, you know, trying to limit the amount of scrolling on a tab and then just not having, you know, 20 something tabs on a, on a dashboard. But, and again, he's like, you may have some, something insight there as well. No, I totally agree. The only thing is that adding too many tabs, it can also confuse the end user. Uh, at the end of the day. So you really don't want Yeah, to that's what I'm talking about, more of that readability, usability. Yes. yes. It, if you have four or five different lines of tabs, then someone will have to start searching in their tabs and I'm not sure how good uh, user experience that will give them. So try to limit it to what they need and then maybe having a separate dashboard for half of the tabs can uh, do the trick to help the end users find the information they need faster. Okay, great. Um, so we got a couple more here. Let me see. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get this one first in the second one. So what negative impacts can be foreseen to score sheets, scorecards when data sources need to be maintained and or refined? I, if I need to change my data source filters three months into data collection, this will be noticeable when viewing existing visuals, is it possible to create a data start point or would a change like this inherently require new data sources and new data visualizations? And I think specifically what he's talking about is, is using a data source in, um, in an indicator source. And um, the, the, I think it really comes down to how often you're running your data collections. And if you're doing historic data collections, um, I mean, if you're doing a daily, then, you know, and if we're talking about just filters of what data that you're actually collecting or, or what you want in the data source itself, if you're running running daily, it, it, it shouldn't impact what's historical. But if you do a historical slash true up type job, then it, then it will change that. So you have to keep that in mind if you are using a data source and you need to change it, there will be down downhill effects of that change on anything that is there. Um, existingly. Um, Dan, Isaac, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think having a, a duration in your data source, it makes it a bit tricky, especially when you need to use it in, your, uh, in a KPI. So if you have an indicator which assumes that the last three months are included into it, changing your data source uh, changes completely even your KPI. So what you said is right, but uh, what you wrote is right, but uh, you have to be a bit more conscious of if you have durations in your data sources, which you use in your indicators, um, then you have, uh, yeah, then you can put yourself into a bit of a trouble when you need to maintain them instead of creating every time data sources which defeats the purpose of the feature at the end of the day. So you, do, you need the uh, data source so that 
you have a set of conditions that helps everyone in the company use it. So if you have durations which can change based on certain uh, decisions or logic that you have, then it will it will just make it even more difficult for you. I would rather keep the data source simple without durations and add the duration is as an additional condition on it than actually uh, putting it in the data source. I agree. Great explanation. All right. And then the last one, um, are there any tricks on troubleshooting slow breakdown scripts? <laughs> Yes. Well, number one, <laughs> and this, this is gonna, and, and yeah, I was gonna say it's uh, right. That the first is, and it's and it's gonna sound somewhat sarcastic, but it really isn't. Is um, do whatever you can to avoid scripts in breakdowns. Um, breakdown scripts are almost always any anytime you're using scripting during the PA data collection process for anything other than just like determining a duration is going to be a severe performance hit. Um, so, and often what, uh, what breakdown scripts are used for are things like, you know, determining what value to use or converting a text string, uh, you know, or com comparing a text string against a manual breakdown to determine, you know, what, which, you know, which bucket to put a, you know, put a record into. Those can, those are much better addressed by uh, modifying the, the data source itself. So you're know, going into the table that is feeding your, so if it's got, so if it's an incident, going into the incident table and actually um, materializing the data based upon, you know, using the script at that, at like a business rule level to say, I want to define what, you know, uh, what this particular record, how this particular record should be sorted in that database field itself, as opposed to relying upon PA to do that. Um, so, so generally it's, you know, it's always, you know, it's always a good idea. It, I would say it's never a good idea to have a script um, to help define your breakdown. Yeah. Ethak, you got more to add to that? Yes, just on the troubleshooting part. Uh, usually when I have to do that, what you need to do, just uh, copy your script and go to an instance that it's not production, uh, use a hard-coded value and make sure that they capture the performance before and after the script. If uh, what Dan said, that script is going to be evaluated for each one of the records in your source. So if that takes two seconds, then, for example, then you have to multiply that with the number of records that are in your data set. And that is how long it's going to take additional time for your script. So make sure that you change that script to become as fast as possible, to less than uh, with a few milliseconds, it, it can be, well, as acceptable in quotes as it can be. A single uh, one, if it takes even one second, with one million records, imagine, one million seconds you, uh, the collection will take. So make sure that you make one record to run fast and that is all that you need. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan and Isaac. I appreciate it. So it looks like there, there aren't any more questions and so we'll go ahead and close this up. So again, Isaac, thank you very much. Uh, great information that is highly needed and uh, will serve great purpose out in the community and also on YouTube for people to research to uh, hopefully fix and you know create some great tuning solutions for their instances as well. So I appreciate you joining today and sharing the great content that you, um, that you shared. So with that, real quickly, um, make sure that you go out on to the community page. This will be out there later on today. Uh, as soon as the recording comes back to me, I'll, I'll get everything and I'll have it back out there today. And then also you can see any of the previous ones that are, are out there and have access to those as well. And then uh, just the community as a whole, make sure that you're using that not only for the academy sessions, but also to ask questions and also to look at some of the predefined information that we already have, have out there. For example, how to, to help you how to, how to get started, um, how to hit the ground running, keep pushing, uh, training uh, solutions that are out there. And of course, the power of the community where we have all of the articles and blogs um, uh, broke down into different sections to help you sort of filter through those. 
Um, make sure that you're out on Now Learning. There's great information that's out there. Um, don't lose track of that. Make sure that you have an account if you don't have one and get as much training as you possibly can. Um, some other great uh, sessions that are out there is Platform Foundations, Mobile App, and Virtual Agent. So if you need information or are curious uh, about those different ones as well, uh, the links are here for you to actually access those, access those and register to attend one of those events as well. Uh, again, if you're going to ask questions out in the community, and we definitely recommend that you do, here's a great um, article that's out there that actually will help you write a really good uh, question that hopefully will get it answered uh, very fast. Um, and this is just a, a, a wrap up of everything that I just said. So just remember all these things. And then um, again, thank you, Isak. Thank you, Dan. And then everyone that attended. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.